and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blast. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how. So Christian, lift up your voice and sing eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. All right, great to see everybody here this morning. Glad you're here and glad he lives in our heart. And if you do not know that Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, today's a great day to make him your personal Savior. Good to see Miss Paulette back. And doing better, and she's been sick for a little while, glad she's doing well. Good to see everybody here. Let's pray and get right into the service for today. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for allowing us to, to be in your house once again. I pray that you'd encourage our hearts. Thank you for this beautiful weather you've given to us. We're thankful for it at this time. We know it's going to get colder soon, but we're thankful for this beautiful day you've given to us at this time. I pray that you'd encourage our hearts, and Lord, as always, if somebody does not know you as a personal Savior, may today be that wonderful day they get saved. We love you, Lord, and thank you for being a good God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Let me see it. All right, number 363, 363, and we'll sing that on the first and last verse. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, Hard and there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did spend at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, hard and there was multiplied to me, there my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. All right, as always, we want to recognize first-time visitors we may have here this morning. If you are visiting for the first time, I will have you raise your hand at this time. It's always great to have visitors here. And uh, if you already got, good to see you, brother. If you have any, if you have not received a visitor's card yet, we have ushers that will be glad to come give that to you. I think they've already given out. They do a great job of that because we want you to receive your gift. At my right and your left out there in the foyer, you can receive a gift from our church. Anybody visiting for the first time that did not receive, or it's been a long time, that's what Brother Bussy says, that's a good one too. It's been a long time would you, and you've not received a visitor's card. Would you please raise your hand? All right, I think the ushers already got you. Great. Thank you so much. Well, Brother Bussy is out of town this week, and he's actually preaching at the church he used to work at there in the Chicago land area, and uh, so he's gone for this weekend. He was here yesterday morning to help us with the Show Me Gospel, and speaking of that, wanted to give you an update or report on that that's very exciting. Yesterday, we set a new record with uh, people coming out and also with how many was distributed, and so yesterday, Miss Nikki keeps very good track of that. Did we lose any bins and lids 
because that's always one of her big concerns. Uh, last week, somebody sold some on eBay or something like that, so we, that's always a concern of Miss Nikki's too. But all the bins and lids are saved. That's a blessing. But after yesterday, yesterday alone, 2,277 John and Romans were distributed. Wow. So we broke a record over 2,000 in one day. Our, we beat our high by more than 300. Our total passed out to date now is 13,753 John and Romans have gone out in the community. And we are officially 100% done with everything east of Highway 179. So that's exciting as far as the boots on the ground goes. And, and we're only a few weeks away from being done with actually physically distributing them and we'll start mailing them out uh, too also. And we should have the whole project finished as our original goal by Thanksgiving. So what a blessing. Thank you all so much for coming out. Uh, those that cook and get things ready on Saturday mornings. Miss Nikki, Brother Brian, I think Miss Nikki even drives the route sometimes, figuring the streets out and making sure we get the right streets. And it's always so organized. And I, t I take usually anywhere from 9 to 14 with me on Saturday because I take the van and take all the teenagers. And it's just it's so nice to have it organized. We just, boom, we get out and do these streets. And, and it's a blessing. The feedback's been overwhelming from the community and, and just so much positive feedback. So thank you so much for all those that have been a part of it. And hopefully you can be a part of it before this thing is over. And we look forward to seeing God doing great things as a result of that. So again, 2,277 yesterday, broke 2,000 in one day, and broke the record, previous record, by 300, 13,753. And everything east of Highway 179, which is right up here, is finished. So praise the Lord. And give the Lord a hand and give yourselves a hand for that. We praise the Lord for that. Go ahead, do that. God is good. And, uh, you know, we, we clap for so many things in the world. It's good to clap for a good reason this time. Amen. So praise the Lord for that. It's great to see everybody here this time. And I believe at this time, the choir is going to sing for us. Thank you.
1187. You sing on the first verse and have a time of fellowship. I heard an old, old story How to sing the king from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sin And won the victory and say hi to your neighbors. Cleansing 
on the last verse. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. John chapter 13 this morning, John chapter 13. Great to see y'all. Great singing today. I love that hymn. I think that's the theme song of Bible Baptist Church and uh, Victory in Jesus. Thank you, Brother Josh, for leading singing. Choir, great job. Appreciate it. And you're special now from the Estes ladies. That's a blessing to have them back singing. John 13. How many of you are married to the man that you have a hard time getting something for him for birthday or anniversary or Christmas? Like the man who has everything, right? Many of you are raising your hands. How many have a wife like that? All right, there's a few of you. Some of you, it's easy. It's easy to buy. How many of you have a kid like that? You don't ever want to get, get him for birthdays and Christmas. They say it's hard to shop or buy things for the man who has everything. And I asked my wife this question the other day, and she thought about it. And I've asked several of my friends this last week. If Jesus wanted one thing from all of us, what would he desire of us? What's one thing we can do for him, for the, for the man, for the God who has everything, right? And uh, that's right. It's all about the souls. Brother George got that. And he's, Don't steal my thunder yet. I'm not preaching yet, okay? <laughs> you, you usually ruin my illustrations, but that time you helped it, Brother George. I appreciate that. Mrs. George, you got it right for once. And so <laughs> that's a blessing. Write that down in his baby book. So, uh, By the way, teenage guys, don't forget after church, I need your shoe sizes. So get that back to me. All right, let's look at verse number 12. John 13, verse number 12. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, I love this, happy, or also it means blessed, are ye if ye do them. Happy are ye if ye do them. I almost titled it, How to Not Be a Miserable Christian Anymore, but we got a different title for it, and I think it'll be an encouragement to you. Father, help us today. May the message and the intent of it speak to all of our hearts. Lord, I thank you for this great crowd you've given us this morning. Pray bless Brother Bus, he's his away preaching and his family. I pray that you would bless Junior Church that's going on right now. And Lord, thank you that the deaf are coming back as they've recovered and getting healthier. Thank you, Lord, for our sounder ministry. And thank you so much for all you've done with the Show Me Gospel. But Lord, for these next few moments, we need your help. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts and challenge us that we might please you more than ever. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness bore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom 
such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down to him glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross is spoken i am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior i'm yours forever jesus christ my in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ. sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope jesus christ my living hope god you are my living hope Man, never go wrong singing praises to God. That's a blessing. Thank you. Somebody here in the family sing together too. What a blessing. So good, John. Let's go back to John chapter 4. I'll be bouncing around a couple other parts of the Gospels today. You will have your life changed when you begin to understand the dispensations of the Bible and how God intended everything to be written in, in, in the right order that he did. The Old Testament and the New Testament do not contradict each other but rather confirm each other. We understand that the Bible is written for two main purposes. One, for horizontal benefit. I call that for our earthly living because we do live on this planet. And then there's a vertical component to it too, which is for spiritual benefit and purposes. When David killed Goliath, that was more of a physical act. When a soul gets saved in the New Testament, that is a spiritual act. And as I mentioned Wednesday night, I feel like there's going to come a day when we get to heaven where the Old Testament saints will actually ask us as Christians, say, what was it like to witness the salvation of a soul? What an amazing thing, a miracle we should never take for granted. That to be able to say that somebody got saved, wait a minute, to think about how I got saved or how you got saved by the grace of God. The salvation that God gave to us. The Old Testament sets up the stage for Jesus and his ministry. The Old Testament is nation-focused. New Testament is individual-focused. 
So it shifted a little bit the mindset and the intent of what God had to do with mankind. In the Old Testament, the emphasis was on Israel a lot. And it will go back to that someday. But the New Testament, the church, has a different mission or burden than the Old Testament had. And, and, and I don't have time to get into all that. So when Jesus came to earth, he showed everybody his intent. Now we understand that for 30 years, there's not a whole lot about him. We understand some exposure to his birth. We see a little bit of him when he's 12. And then from 12 to 30, those 18 years, it's, it's, it's quiet. There's not a whole lot about him. And then 30 to 33 and a half years. Three and a half years. That's all he had. He transformed everything, horizontally and vertically. And everything Jesus did vertically was to benefit horizontally, and everything Jesus did horizontally was to benefit vertically. They worked together. So the Old Testament and the New Testament were married, so to speak, by Jesus' ministry. When Paul came along, he starts to encourage the church, teaching us horizontal activities, how to get along with all of our horizontal relationships, with the intent of helping us personally and those around us vertically in the spiritual realm. So when Jesus is coming, we have to understand the time frame in which he's reaching. He's reaching the Jewish people at first. He's ministering to them. And, and if you know anything about the Old Testament, there was a very serious pride that came along with being of the seed of Abraham. Being able to claim Moses as a part of your heritage. Much like we Americans like to talk about George Washington and all those, uh, these guys took it to a whole new level when it came to being able to say, uh, we're from Moses and, and Abraham, and, and that, that's our forefathers. Those are our, so to speak, Old Testament patriots, our Old Testament leaders, and, and they clung to them, and, and it was all about being the best you could possibly be and, and being that leader and being the champion and, and being the king of a nation and being the best nation in the world. And then Jesus comes and shocks these Jews who've been taught that all their life, taught about David, taught about Abraham and Moses, taught about David's mighty men, and Jesus washes their feet. In fact, if you, if you don't believe me, read earlier in the chapter and note Peter's protest to it. Peter says, you're not washing my feet. And Jesus says, fine, you have nothing to do with me. And then Peter says, no, 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 wash everything then. I want to be a part of what you're doing. And Jesus washes his feet. And then he says this, as we said earlier. Actually, let's go back to John 13 again, just real quickly. John chapter 13. I'm laying the groundwork for the, the message today, just briefly. Look, it says, it says again in verse number 12. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garment and was, was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? What a great question. He's asking, do you guys realize what I just did? Do you realize what I just did? Do you understand the significance of what I did? That's what Jesus is saying here. You call me master and Lord. And you say, well, for I am. That's tr that was a true statement, right? It's a true statement that Jesus is the master and Lord. That's a true statement. And then Jesus goes on and says this. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you, and here's the difference right here, an example. So what does Jesus really want from us? on his birthday, on whatever, when we want to surprise him or do something nice for him, what does he want from us? And here, let me put the slide up now. What Jesus wants us to do again and again and again. And I want you to look at John chapter 4 now. Let's go back to John chapter 4, then we'll go to John chapter 8 and John chapter 9, and we'll see the word again pop up a few times in this passage. And in John chapter 4, Jesus comes to Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And the Bible says there was a certain nobleman, verse 46, whose son was sick at Capernaum. And when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. That's what he says. Why did he say that? Again, because that's what the Old Testament had conditioned them to believe. The Bible goes on and says this, The noble man saith unto him, Sir, come down ere before my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man, I love these next three words, believed the word, amen, that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, Hey, thy son liveth. Wow, what a miracle. And by the way, can I just throw this out here? This miracle, I think, was more important than Jesus turning the water to wine. His mama wanted that done. I think he 
indulged her to make her happy. Right, Brother Tim? We talked about it the other day. But in John chapter 4, he's performing a greater miracle. But all of his miracles, everything he did was with the intent of one thing. Here it is. Helping somebody leave different. Help. Jesus was the master of the ministry of helps, which goes back to Brother George's answer, souls being saved. He was the minister of help. This world has always needed help. As soon as Adam and Eve partook of the fruit, the reason they hid is for the first time in their lives they understood this concept. We need help. We need help. And they didn't know what to do because the serpent all of a sudden left them and that's how the devil is. He'll get us to the brink, get us to fall, and then he'll abandon us. So they tried to help themselves, and they failed. So God came, and what did he do? Help them. And he consistently helped them. And he consistently helped the nation of Israel. And he helped his people. And he helped even some Gentiles in the Old Testament. And he helped and helped. And then we come to Jesus, and he takes the ministry of helps to a whole new level. And he spends his whole life, the three and a half years of ministry that the Bible tells us about, until he goes to the cross and the resurrection, which are the two greatest helps he gave to us. In that three and a half years, all he did was help. And that's what Jesus wants us to do as Christians. Again and again and again and again and again and again is to just help somebody else. That's it. What can I give to the man who has everything? What can I do for the Son of God who spoke this world into existence? What can I do for the King of kings and the Lord of lords? How can I appease him? How can I satisfy him? How can I please him? And I understand we, tonight I'm going to talk about worshiping him, what we can do for him personally. But when it comes to the ministry, when it comes back to what I said in the original part of the message, how we have this horizontal and vertical thing, when it comes to the exterior of our lives, now tonight again I'm going to talk about the personal part. But today when it comes to that part of it, he says help Somebody. Help somebody. You know why? Because man always, 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 always needs help. I need help. And I have been helped. We all need help. And God has chosen, instead of sending us on crusades to, to fight giants, which sounds a lot more like more fun to me, I mean, I'd like to go to battle for him, right? We will someday, but instead of sending us on these, on these, on these conquests to overtake lands like he did Joshua, and, and instead of standing up on, on Mount Carmel like Elijah, he sends you and me to a little kid in town that needs help. He sends you and me to an older person in town who needs some help. He sends you and me to the co-worker who needs some help. And by the way, today, America will not get the help it needs by what happens on the first Tuesday of November. They've told us they're going to help us for years, and typically they help themselves. I actually saw a funny mask this week I would actually consider wearing. It says, this mask is as useless as a politician. Somebody say amen right there. But the fact of the matter is, this country, this county, this city, this neighborhood, your coworkers, even family, need help. And Jesus is saying, look, 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 your feet were dirty. They were very dirty, and their feet got dirty back then. I mean, I think I have beautiful feet compared to Peter. We're going to compare them when we get to heaven. My wife disagrees with one verse in the Bible. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel? She says that, that's the only verse in the Bible she struggles with. The Bible says the preacher's feet are beautiful. If you're a preacher today, you have beautiful feet. The Bible says so, amen. But the point I'm trying to make is this. He, he humbles himself. He gets down on his knees. He takes it. The Bible says he put his garment back on. So he got down and he knew he was going to get dirty. The splashing around. I've seen the illustration. We do it here. A little cup of water. I think it was a mess. There was like probably mud on the floor. I mean, these guys walked around in sandals all day long in the dirt and the dust of Israel. And Jesus washed them and humbled himself. And he's saying, your feet were dirty. Something as simple as that. But for three and a half years now, as I get ready to go to the cross, you've observed me and you've watched me. And watch, what have I done? I've helped people and helped people and helped children and helped women and helped men and helped families and helped people who had power, helped people who had nothing to give me, helped the poor, helped the rich. He helped and he helped and he helped and he helped them again and again and again. And that, my friend, is what Jesus wants us to do again and again and again. He is readily available and willing to give us the help we need to help those out there. 
And he has helped us through his word. He's helped us through fellowship. He's helped us through the church. He's helped us through family and friends of the faith. He has helped us so that we might help them. And in turn of doing that, it actually helps him. He doesn't necessarily need that help, but it pleases him. John chapter 8, early in the morning, he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And in verse 3, And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, when they had set her in the midst. Next chapter, John chapter 9, and verse number 1, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. So you see that, and you can find it in the Matthews and the Marks and the Lukes and the Johns. But again and again, this past week we have seen people who had needed some help. Now I was blessed that the other day we got a phone call from someone who got a John Romans. A lady requested a visit from a lady in our church. She asked for a lady that was more seasoned. And I'm glad I knew who to call. I called Mrs. George. And she spent two and a half, and I say that in a very complimentary way, Mrs. George. You are the, you are the man. I mean, you are the lady. You are just, you're awesome. And she went and spent two and a half hours with a lady last Friday. And yet this morning I was driving the bus. We picked up 24 kids today, by the way. The bus numbers are climbing back up again. But you know why they are? Because he didn't tell me this. He would never tell me this. But somebody on the bus said, hey, did you know Brother Trevor spent two hours at one kid's house yesterday playing four square in his driveway? I'm not saying we all have to do that, but that's why the bus route's going to 24 again. And he doesn't know I'm telling you this. And he didn't ask me to tell you this. He probably wouldn't want me to tell you this, but I'm going to tell you. Because it's those little things. When somebody's getting attention from somebody who has it better than they do. And by the way, can I say something? If we're saved and they're not saved, I don't care how much more money they have than me. I've got it better than they do. If I talk to Jesus this morning, I've got it pretty good. If I was able to read my Bible this morning, I've got it pretty good. If I was able to pray to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, I've got it pretty good today. Help and help and help. You see, Christians slowly start to turn miserable and critical when they think, when everything turns inwardly. When we get our eyes off of them and start looking at us, we become miserable Christians. And we disappoint what Jesus wants us to do again and again. Christianity has been so twisted in America today. We, we, we think it's all about us, and it's not. If anybody, anybody had the right to say it's all about me, it was Jesus Christ. But he said it's about you. It's about the blind man on the side of the road. It's about the little children that want to come to me. And all oh, the disciples even said, shoo, 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 because that's the way the Jews were taught. You don't bother a man of prestige and honor and clout and power. No, no, bring the children. Suffer them to come unto me. And by the way, as a pastor of this church, suffer the children to come to Bible Baptist Church. Suffer the children to come on in. We want them here. Where else do we put them right? I'm glad a bunch of kids got on the bus route. Maybe they'll do some damage. Maybe they'll rip some things. That's okay. I want them here. Suffer the children. Why? Because we all need help. We all need help today. And that's the main purpose of the church. There's three areas we need to really focus and emphasize our help on. Number one, our own household. Our own household. You see there the opening passage, John chapter 4, the second miracle of the book of John. And by the way, even the first one where he changed the water to wine, he did that because his mama wanted him to. My mom's birthday is tomorrow. So if my mom wants me to change water into wine for her birthday, I'll try my best. You just get a glass of water and just spike it, right? Is that how you turn water to wine? I mean, I don't have the same powers as Jesus, but I can try, Mom. If you want tomorrow, I'll make it for you, Mom. Love you. And she's like, what is he saying? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm in trouble. All right, so. <laughs> Church, it is our time right now. And when Jesus comes back to Cain of Galilee, when he comes again, as the Bible says in verse 46, Jesus came again. He came because he knew why he was going to be there. And the Bible says a certain nobleman whose son was sick, he comes. He's concerned for his household. And may I say to you today, church, we as Christians need to follow the example of our Savior. I read the verse several weeks ago when I talked about my parents. In John chapter 19, verse 26, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, woman, behold thy son. The most important people I have to help as a father and as a husband is my wife and children the people in my own household what an awesome responsibility to be able to say hey to my wife and my kids we're going to be a house as for me and my house we will serve the Lord we will choose Jesus I'm not ashamed to say that I want to help my kids make the right decisions I want to help them as they start to go through the paths of life start with your own household today all of us I had the opportunity to teach the teenage class this morning since Brother Bussy was out of town on the subject of finding the right approval 
We don't realize that we spend our whole lives living for the approval of somebody else. And a lot of approval is bad, but a lot of approval is good. And there's a good approval. And one of them raised their hand and said, I want to live for the approval of my grandparents. What a blessing. What a testimony that grandparents can help their household. The testimony of two and three generations of Christians helping their household, living as examples, making a difference. Yeah, Mitchell kids and George kids, I want you to know your grandma spent two and a half hours the other day with somebody helping them. What a blessing to know we have people like that in our church. Help your own household, first of all. The person we're supposed to love the most. Sometimes, sadly, we treat them the worst sometimes. As a church today, it starts right there in your house. We always say it starts in Jerusalem, Judea. Well, let me say, it starts right in my house. Help them of your own household. In his darkest moments on the cross, he still looked down and made sure his mom was taken care of. Because Jesus helped his household. Number two, notice this. Help the hurting. Help the hurting. Luke, let's go to Luke real quick. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. I know some of you today might be hurting. And this church cares about you. We love you. We want to help you. But let me tell you something right now. There's a whole lot of people out in our area that are hurting. There's confusion out there. There's uncertainty. I'm kind of excited about that because I think the church is going to be able to really rise and shine in this dark in these last days. I think we can make a difference if we're known as a church that helps people. Sometimes people will criticize the things we do, and I'm saying, I'm sorry you don't want our help, but really what I want to do is just show you that we care about you. I'll never forget several years ago, a lady called our church. She was very upset that the teenagers had passed out tracks and put them on her door. And I said, ma'am, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize you would be upset about that. Maybe we should let them run the streets and do drugs and do alcohol and break in and rob things and fornicate. She stopped me and said, sir, please stop. I'm sorry. I will never complain again. They can come to my house anytime they want to. What's the point? Once people realize that there's others out there that need help, we've got to make a difference. There's people hurting everywhere around us. They are all over the place. And when you start to talk to them and you ask them questions and you pay attention to them, it's amazing how open people become today. They are looking for somebody to help them. And they know it's not going to be found in the governor's mansions or the White House or in Congress or in the Senate. But they'll find those answers in the church house. And the more we help all those out there, it's amazing how it'll affect what happens in politics too. The hurting. Look at Luke chapter 8, verse 43. And a woman having an issue of blood, 12 years, 12 years, she spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him, Jesus, and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood was stanched. She was hurting. She tried everything. She had spent everything she had. But she found her answer and help with Jesus Christ. They need help. Everywhere they need help because they're hurting. They're hurting. Number one, help them of your own household. Number two, help them that are hurting. Number three, and I'm done. Help the hopeless. The hopeless. Oh, the devil sold them a bill of goods, man. The devil has mastered deception. And he has so many people out here who on the front side, Brother Nathan and I were texting about the difference between mind and heart, even this morning, about the mind and the heart. And and religion can, can soothe and convince the mind that everything's okay. But in your heart of hearts, You know it's not right. You know the peace isn't there. How do you know that, preacher? Because I lived that. I mean, I was was of the religious mindset. And I thought it was okay up here. I had it figured out up here. It's what that man told me to do. It's what that preacher told me to do up here. But when I found out what Jesus told me to do right here because a pastor actually wanted to help me, it changed my life. I want you to go to Mark chapter 9. I've always loved this story. Mark chapter 9. The story of a man, and I can't even imagine being a father like this, whose son was so demon-possessed that he would cast himself into water to drown himself or throw himself in a fire, the Bible says. And I want you to see what he says here. It says in verse number 22, And oft times it hath cast him in the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us. And what is his cry here? What does he say? And what? Help us. And Jesus saith unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. The world is looking for hope. They want somebody to say, It's going to be okay. And religion can't ever tell you that honestly. And the government, dead sure, can't tell us that honestly. Education can't satisfy that itch of hope. But to know the love of the Lord 
and to know Jesus Christ personally is hope. That everything he says in this book is true. Going back to the Old Testament, New Testament, by the way, not confliction, but I mean, they, they cooperate together. Going back to the differences between the two, we see that God has always had a desire to give mankind hope. From Adam and Eve to the first Sunday of October 2020, God wants to give us hope. And Jesus says, don't you understand what I just did? Don't you understand the significance of what I just did for you? I washed your feet. I cleaned your feet. I humbled myself in such a way because I want you to see and understand that for three and a half years, I have taught you that all you can do really for me, the man who has everything, the man who's going to be able to die and raise himself up three days later from the grave, the man who can speak the universe into existence, this son of God and son of man, here's what I want you to do. What is it, Jesus? Give us the answer. Here it is. Help somebody. The soul their hurts, their fears, their doubts. And Christian today, as Jesus said in John chapter 13, happy are ye if you do these things. Let's make a difference and do what Jesus wants us to do again and again and again and again. Had you bowed out your close. Thank you for listening so long. Hello, Pastor Randy Dignan here of Bible Baptist Church in Jefferson City, Missouri. I'm going to take a moment and express to you what our main vision and purpose is of this ministry. You see, much of this world today has a question. It's a question that was asked in John chapter 3 by one person. It's a question that is asked by the masses, but when you really think about it, it's really a question we all have to come to grips with, face to face with, one on one in our lives, sometime in our life. The question is this, where will I spend eternity? And that question was asked by a religious leader by the name of Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He approached Jesus Christ in the middle of the night and had a question about spiritual matters. Well, good thing for Nicodemus. He came to the right person at the right time because Jesus Christ is the answer in spiritual matters. You see, many of us have questions about that, and man has tried in many of its efforts to answer that question with their own ideas and philosophies. We've tried to come up with ideas on how to get us to heaven, how to confirm our way to heaven, but the fact is we gotta find out what God says about eternal things, and that's why asking Jesus Christ that question is so vital, because when you ask Jesus a question, you get the answer. And as the question was asked, Jesus answered simply this, you must be born again. In John chapter 3, that's what he said to Nicodemus, and that's the same thing he says to you and to me, even today. You see, God is God of this universe, but he's not everybody's father. What does that have to do with John chapter 3? Well, think about this. We all have birthdays. We all are physically born under this physical planet, or else you wouldn't be able to watch me, or I wouldn't be able to sign to you right now or talk to you at this time. But God, being a spiritual being, knew that though our bodies are temporal, our spiritual part of us, our spiritual anatomy of us, is an eternal thing. And so God says, I'm more concerned about the spiritual issues. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you and me 2,000 years ago and live again three days later so that you and I can have a spiritual birthday and know for sure that heaven is our home. Well, that leads to the next question. Why do we need a spiritual birthday? Well, it's simple. We're all sinners. We've all broken God's law and God's commands. But God loves us so much so that he let Jesus Christ become the substitute for your sin and my sin. So that if we recognize and admit that we are sinners, we can then trust in Jesus Christ as our substitute. And more so than that, our personal Savior. And know that on top of our physical birthdays, we have a spiritual birthday now. In that God becomes our father. We become his sons, daughters. We become his children and we know we're going to go to heaven someday. My friend, it's very simple. It's not about what the church says, what I have ideas about, or what you have ideas about. It's finding out what God says directly to you and me. And he did it right there in the Bible, and in particular, John chapter 3, when Jesus says, you must be born again. If our church can help you with that question, if you have any questions about that, we can give you some answers. We'd be glad to help you in any way we can. Again, Pastor Randy, personally thanking you for watching the message. And again, if there's anything we can do for you, let us know. God bless, and make it a great day.